This is API Case Files. Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like E.T. said. Hello, and welcome to API Case Files. I'm Marsha Barnhart, API Chief of Investigations, and your host for this summer 2015 episode. Later in the program, you'll also hear from Antonio Paris, the director of the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations team, and API Deputy Director Paul Carr. In this Episode 7, I examine aspects of the as-of-yet-fully-understood fourth state of matter, plasma. Additionally, Paul Carr, in his series Unidentified Science, will talk about the difficulty of adhering to scientific principles when endeavoring to investigate high-strangeness cases. Antonio, Paul, and I, during a recent recorded Google Hangout, discussed a few of our more interesting investigations that we're currently involved in, so a portion of that discussion will be included in this episode and another portion in our next API case files. Also in this episode, I file a report on a MUFON organization seminar recently held in Erie, Pennsylvania. Investigating reported UFO sightings can be a real challenge, as you might guess. Not only does the investigative process often call for research into a variety of different disciplines, physics, optics, psychology, earth sciences, etc., but the investigator has to conduct a witness interview to uncover the four basic W's, who, what, when, where. And in addition to basic facts, the investigator needs to form some opinion of the witness. Does the witness seem truthful? Is there contradiction in the answers when questions are posed in several different ways? Does the witness appear too eager to please? Or the opposite, evasive? As Antonio has often said, the witness interview is a cornerstone in laying the basic foundation for the investigative process. In today's program, as I mentioned earlier, Antonio, Paul, and myself will discuss a few cases, but I would like to start the program showcasing one of my recently closed cases, number 15-001. It took place December 27, 2014, at 4.15 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. A witness in Washington State had a chance daytime sighting of oddly behaving smallish objects in the sky near his Seattle area neighborhood. Fortunately, he had the presence of mind to activate his phone camera, so he also supplied a 25-second video clip along with his original witness statement. I contacted him, conducted an interview, and was granted permission by him to use his audio interview and his video clip. This footage, by the way, will be made available at a site linked in our show notes. So, here is the witness from Case 15-001 regarding the multiple objects he sighted near Seattle the afternoon of December 27, 2014. Uh, I was headed home from work and I decided to stop by the post office uh, near the office. And uh, I got out of my car and went into the post office, came back out. And uh, upon getting to my my car, I noticed uh, off in the the distance in the sky above the the tree lining and and building lining and saw um, several different light orbs floating in a kind of an odd pattern. So I thought, uh, hmm, are those maybe birds, um, because the light kind of was lighter on some of them and a little darker on some others. If you were to be up to the objects, how big do you think they were? They were probably about the size of a tennis ball. Okay. There were like two swarms. Of the two swarms, how many were in each group? Uh, There was five-ish in the the 
one on the left, and there was probably about a dozen or so in the one on the right. And about how far away from your position would you say they were? You thought that it was over an interstate. Yeah, yeah. So it was about, uh, it was within three miles. Might have been like two and a half or something. Okay. Now let's talk about their their color or luminosity. What can you remember about that? Because, yeah, there wasn't like, it's not like they were blue or red or, you know, a distinguishable color. They were definitely like a a dark color, and then they got lighter as the whatever light either appeared on them or throughout them. Now, it looked like the weather had been stormy. Had it been raining, or was there any thunder, or do you recall anything of that nature in the weather? No thunder or lightning. Uh, the area that I did see them in was, uh, you know, gray, gray skies, kind of stormy-ish looking. But, I mean, Washington weather is pretty odd at best. Uh, so in that particular area, it was gray. But then if you pan to the left, basically to the north, it was blue skies. And if you pan, pan to the south, it was blue-ish skies. At my first glance of the footage, these objects looked like a flock of birds soaring in some thermal updraft. The sky was rather dark and stormy looking, and indeed a check of the weather conditions showed overcast skies with intermittent rain showers during that time. Visibility was about 8 miles, winds were out of the southeast at about 8 miles per hour, and the temperature was in the low 40s. I zoomed in and examined the footage, then I added an embossed effect to the video. I was expecting to see the outline of wings, still thinking these might be birds, but once embossed, the object's shapes really stood out, and I could easily discern perfectly round spheres, shaded appropriately to the environmental lighting conditions present. It was an intriguing sight. As far as I could determine, these objects were not birds, not balloons, not Chinese lanterns, nor, as I could tell, many drones flying in formation. But I could not determine what the objects were. To my eye, and according to the witness, it appeared as though the objects were self-illuminated and self-propelled. But it was difficult to tell anything with any certainty. They seemed to be moving of their own accord in a small, undefined pattern of motion. I ended up closing case 15-001 as unidentified. Yet another instance of these vexing orbs that seem to be everywhere, yet often undefinable. Indeed, orbs are one of the more common UFO sightings, and they appear worldwide. My research is leading me to suspect that some of these orb-like objects may be examples of what is called self-sustaining embodiments of electrical force. In other words, a form of ball lightning. Now, I realize many people may think this is an untenable supposition. Ball lightning is considered a relatively uncommon occurrence. But nonetheless, it is an actual phenomenon that exists under certain conditions. Even though this phenomenon has been experienced and written about in first-person accounts, scientists still do not clearly understand the physics behind the formation and behavior of naturally occurring plasma energy. But research indicates that widespread geoengineering efforts may be creating atmospheric changes conducive to increased electromagnetic energy in our atmosphere, and this, in turn, may be creating conditions that are increasing the formation, the instances, of ball lightning or plasma balls. We at API don't normally go into trying to explain what an object is unless we're quite certain we can identify it, but I thought I would use this case and other orb cases that I have had or am familiar with to examine an area of science that is rather unfamiliar. Now, some years ago, pilots were reporting lightning in the outer atmosphere. These were flashes of white or reddish-orange colored light that occurred higher than their planes were flying, sometimes between 30 and 50,000 feet in the air. Scientists rejected this notion, regardless of the first-person account from pilots, because science at the time did not have a model to explain how this could occur. 
Now, however, there is an understanding of what is termed sprites. These are large-scale electrical discharges that occur high above thunderstorm clouds. This phenomenon is cold plasma. It lacks the hot channel temperatures of tropospheric lightning. So as a result, sprites typically discharge their energy in a manner akin to a fluorescent flash. Sprites are relatively rare, but they do exist, and they are a little-known phenomenon, even though they've been reported since the late 1800s. Now, past cases with orbs have led me to conduct a lot of research. And at this point, just let me plug here the technical papers put out by the National Aviation Reporting Center on anomalous phenomena, typically known as NARCAP. NARCAP did a study called Project Sphere, which dealt with, among other things, ball lightning, sprites, and the earth light phenomena. You can check out the NARCAP website for information in this area and do read the technical papers on their research. It's very illuminating, so to speak. Getting back to orbs, or more specifically, plasma, ball lightning, there is evidence that governments have been experimenting with releasing chemical aerosols into our atmosphere in an effort to combat global warming and in weather modification experiments. This area of science is known as geoengineering. It's the application of geosciences where mechanics, mathematics, physics, chemistry, and geology are all used to understand and shape our interaction with the Earth. This is the area of science where weather modification techniques are being practiced by the U.S. and other world powers. And this is not conspiracy nut stuff, by the way. As early as 1996, the U.S. Air Force published a research paper on how to, quote, own the weather by 2025. Ownership, it would seem then theoretically, if not practically, is only about a decade away. But ownership is only accomplished after an appropriate period of study and experimentation. So, how is weather modification accomplished? That's a good question. One scientist a retired USDA biologist named Francis Mangles, discussed the finding by scientists of unnaturally high concentrations of some chemicals and particulates that increase conductivity of electromagnetic energy, chemicals such as aluminum oxide and barium. These chemicals would aid in the conditions that increase the formation of atmospheric phenomena such as plasma ball lightning. Typically, but not always, ball lightning forms during stormy conditions where there is a high concentration of electromagnetic charge. Now, that was the case with the Washington State sighting. Ranging in size from one half inch to many meters in diameter, ball lightning can occur in a variety of different colors, and it is luminous enough to be seen clearly in daylight. Most instances last only a few seconds, but if the atmosphere happens to provide the opportunity for prolonged life, the phenomena can sustain itself and replicate. According to R.A. Ford, in his book, Homemade Lightning, Experiments in Electricity, ball lightning has been observed to break up into two or more smaller balls. And once initiated under the right conditions, ball lightning exhibits what is called a localized persistence of individuality. In other words, the self-created plasma balls are not easily dissolved, and they can replicate. That may have been what occurred with the Washington State case and other cases I've investigated. Often the object or objects will be seen to move about and then vanish, decaying either explosively or completely silently. Ball lightning is essentially a plasma ball created by certain atmospheric conditions, made spherical by wind currents, or sometimes flattened yet round on its edges by wind forces. Since this phenomena is electromagnetic, these plasma balls filled with charged particles and gases in a highly concentrated energy state can have movement dictated by hidden metal rods, or even highly clay soil surfaces, or other high concentrations of charged particles within the atmosphere adjacent to the ball lightning. So this might explain cases where a witness observed, say, a self-illuminated orb 
traveling along a telephone line or moving along the ground in one direction and then quickly veering suddenly off to a right angle, this as it actually rolls along a hidden metal pipe under the surface of the ground, for example. This type of movement would make that light appear to be under some intelligent control when instead it's simply being directed by an unseen metallic attraction. In the instance of case 15001, the orbs swirled about, possibly created out of a soup of specific chemicals charged by the stormy atmosphere and blown around in a semicircle by the swirling wind. Science is still struggling to better understand plasma, the fourth state of matter. What creates it exactly, and in what ways can it behave? In light of new information regarding airborne chemicals presently identified, plasma balls may be the culprit for some UFO orb sightings. Now, this does not answer what phenomenon lies behind the sighting of actual metallic spheres moving about in our atmosphere. It only goes to provide the possibility of an answer for those orbs that appear to be organic in substance, are self-illuminated, short-lived, and present in a highly charged electromagnetic atmospheric environment. Although I suspect plasma or ball lightning might be the explanation for case 15-001, I still do not have enough evidence to make that determination, and there may never be a definitive answer. So sometimes the best determination that can be assigned to a well-researched case is unidentified. Next up, listen to a recent Google Hangout case file recording of a discussion between myself, Antonio, and Paul. This is API Case File. Case file. Now, we've had 38 cases so far this year, and many of them have been that they didn't want an investigation. We're also having problems with some people who say they want an investigation, but after you contact them and the initial response, they often end up not replying or getting back with information. It's almost as if the witness has a compelling feeling to tell somebody about what they saw, but they don't necessarily have the oomph to get through an entire investigation. And I don't think many people understand what we mean by investigation, which is going to be multiple contacts to make sure we can nail down and try to identify exactly what they may or may not have seen. And that we have to work with as best we can. I I think all of us this year have gotten cases, I've probably gotten six or seven, where people just stop communicating after the second email. And uh, I couldn't get anything out of them and had to be closed due to lack of witness response. Some that were relatively intriguing cases, too. So we'll discuss some of the cases that we've had a response on and have had the opportunity to get in depth with and come to some conclusion. Yeah, Masha, um, it has nothing to do with API. Well, you know, I worked with MUFON for about three or four years, and it's the same deal. You get a lot of cases. And the witness, most of the time, they won't even respond to the first email or the, you know, and even if they, they submit their email, sometimes you get even their phone numbers, they just won't respond. There could be a million reasons why they don't care. They don't want to be bothered with, it could be a hoax, a scam. They saw, it could be a million things, but people with jobs, family, I don't know, it could be a million things, but it has nothing to do with what, you contact any UFO agency out there and ask them what's your response ratio to this investigation. I'm pretty sure they're low. Um, so it, don't think it's us, aerial phenomena, uh, that nobody likes us. It's, it's across the board. People report things. Like you said, it's off their plate. Adios, muchacho. They don't want to hear from you ever again. Yeah, and I think that you have to understand there's an awful lot of unreported cases out there. There's people who... Uh, will go on online somewhere on the internet and go on at length about what they saw or experienced. But when you ask them, who'd you report it to? They usually say, well, nobody, or they say new fork, you know, a new fork 
doesn't really investigate much, but so uh, they, essentially the information that they had is lost. A prompt report is certain something we want to encourage people to do, even if it's not to us. Yeah, exactly. Um, which, which case should we start with? Well, I've got a pretty intriguing case that I've just come to the end on, and it was uh, out of Wisconsin. It's 15036. Now, this was a, a young army officer who witnessed this, and I felt pretty comfortable in my telephone interview when, when uh, doing the witness interview that this guy was not prone to excitement. He was pretty nailed down. Uh, he's been deployed, and so he knows what flares look like, what artillery looks like. He knows what on wing aircraft looks like, and so this is this is what he supplied in his um, write up to us. I'll read it, and this was a sighting of 21 June. It was about 9:30. And it took place in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. This gentleman wrote, um, on Monday, June 21, 2015, my grandmother and I both witnessed what appeared to be a huge orange meteor falling rapidly downward and perpendicular to the surface of the earth. I say meteor because its rate of descent was very fast, but its bright orange fire color was unlike the bright white color I'm used to seeing in the falling star. Its appearance resembled more of a military-style artillery flare, but falling at a much faster rate of speed. And he said, I'm in the military, so I'm familiar with how these look. Now, here's the kicker. The object then simultaneously began to become less bright as its rate of descent slowed to what appeared to be a hover. At this point, I realized I was witnessing a really unusual phenomenon, so I ran approximately 15 meters to the house to retrieve my video camera. By the time I returned, the object was much less bright, approximately now the magnitude of Venus, but still bright orange, and it was slowly moving eastward. I filmed the object as it moved slowly through the sky. Just as the object approached the tree line from my perspective, it rapidly increased speed and then vanished behind the trees. Now, he put that link on YouTube, and he uh, sent me a link to that, and so I watched that, and this was the object as it had slowed and begun to to uh travel horizontal and away from him and it was it was a pretty compelling video and a pretty compelling and interesting case now i contacted six different uh police departments to see if they had gotten any reports and one of the one of the police departments got back and said they had heard something from some of their officers but nobody had written anything in there was nothing in their logs but I happened to look for other UFO reports, and that same night, at that same time, in that same state, due north in Appleton, Wisconsin, some guy had written about seeing a bright light that was traveling eastward. So there was confirmation of it. Now, what it was, I don't know. It uh, defied logic, and when I looked into, you know, if there was any falling debris, um, there wasn't any. The ISS wasn't traveling over that part that night. It was on the other side of the world. So um, I could find no explanation for that and had to close it as unidentified. But this was a very good witness, and um, he was very cooperative, and I felt it went pretty well. So that was an intriguing one I've had recently. How about you guys? Um, I just opened up the case out of Switzerland with the, with the witness. Um, he's the one that, that sent us the photos of, uh, seeing this, the zigzagging lights and the discs. So that's a fair, I like that case. This is actually probably my best case of the year. We got a witness, which really looks cooperative. Thus far, he's been responding to all my emails. Um, he just sent me his phone number. So I'm hoping to, get, uh, have a f interview with him and he's got, he, you know, he, he's got all the check marks. He's got, he's got. What appears to be photos, you know, they're not that compelling, but at least it tells me something happened. He saw something um, and there's multiple witnesses. So I'm just in the infancy of this of opening this case out of uh, Loisane, Switzerland. Um, I like the case because it's it's not, you know, he's, he saw the object for almost 12 minutes. That's pretty long, you know. 
most people see something what 30 seconds uh, or less or something so this guy had a lot of time to see and observe uh, the object there are multiple witnesses um he has imagery of the alleged uh, object and he's cooperative so he's it's a great case at least from a investigative perspective because you, you get to fill in all those check marks that we usually don't have so uh hopefully we'll get the call tomorrow i'll start my photo forensics here on monday or actually maybe tomorrow and 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 see what we have here really good interesting case out of switzerland well good um my latest case which is still in progress is uh 15029 and this is a case with both a highly cooperative witness who actually knows what he's doing with a camera so uh that this is the first one i've had where there was a photograph uh taken with a high quality prosumer grade camera and actually in what they call raw format we talked about that a bit in episode four with robert and robert is actually looking at these images there, there's really one image that that's particularly important now what this guy is into is uh night long exposure night photography and he sometimes uses lasers or flashlights to paint the trees with light and then it's this nice eerie effect he was outside with his 18 year old son and they were uh they had his camera on a tripod a good tripod and they were they knew that this space station was about to come over um it the space station appeared and they wanted to get that streak across the sky that you get with a long exposure while also getting the stars and the and the tree mm-hmm. and the nearby trees uh this by the way is is um in Washington state and he and his son both noticed a blinking light near where the space station was headed in, in that same area of the sky and he captured it on his camera as i noted it we have raw format and we have uh, a very high quality low noise camera uh, he was actually only shooting at an iso of 640 which is not very high so the noise is is, is fairly low and he was extremely cooperative however his memory did or, or his his understanding of the situation did need some updates uh turns out he thought he was looking to the east after lots of head scratching i realized no way he was looking to the east and he must have been looking to the southwest i pointed that out to him he went out with a compass and came back and said yep sure enough it was southwest he gave me the exact location where he was standing and uh now we have this image um on this exposure that's a 30 second exposure as i noted so if it's if it's flashing you'll get multiple images the object was moving i don't believe it was in orbit um with the space station that it, the fact that the space station was there is in my opinion purely coincidental and you can see at least one really good image of a ring shaped object that is the light is in a ring with a with darkness in the center um and we're looking at that closely there appears to be a trail of these images although most of them are fainter than the than the one really good one near the very very end of the exposure and the trail indicates a, a fair bit of movement but nothing anomalous we we determined that the object is about 7 pixels wide and we identified the stars in the field that was shot and also we know exactly when they when the ISS was coming over to within a couple of seconds so we were able to determine exactly what stars those are in the field of view and by taking measurements on the raw the raw image we were able to determine the angular size of the object and now that doesn't mean that we know the absolute size because we don't know how far away it is but um if it was as far away as a space station it's absolutely enormous it's kilometers in size um it was not moving fast it was moving about one diameter per second which is you know not fast an airplane moves faster than that a uh, satellite much, moves much faster than that so it appears to be a nearby object and uh, what i've asked our image analyst robert to do is a check out that trail make sure it's not just our imaginations 
enhance the image so, so we can really see the trail and see how many images there are there. And also, uh, we want to try to understand how you could get that kind of ring-shaped lighting pattern. And that's something that we don't at present understand. If the object was uh, a kilometer away, a thousand meters, and it's about three meters in size, which would be about the size of a small aircraft. Uh, if it's a uh, hundred meters away, it's um, three tenths of a meter in size, which is the size of a small uh, UAV or it's commonly called a drone. Uh, so somewhere it, it could be somewhere in that range, or it could be even further away. We don't know yet. It, it doesn't, it doesn't pass in front of anything or behind anything in the any any reference object in the field of view while it is in sight. So it's it's a the remarkable thing about this case is how good quality the photographic evidence is, even though the object is small in the field of view. This guy was using a uh, a very wide angle lens. I think it was thirty five set to thirty five millimeters uh, equivalent, which is a wide angle v field of view. So it we don't you know we don't have a good zoomed in view of it. But it's highly cooperative witness. Uh, we know a lot of facts about the case and a uh, good image. So this kind of high quality photography is quite rare in this business. The guy serves as a good example. We have, but we also learned that you know memory, even the memory just from a couple of weeks ago is not perfect. Uh, we had the wrong time. We had the wrong direction. And it, it took a while to recover all the information. But fortunately, I think this guy's on the up and up. He's telling us the truth, and we'll see where it goes. I don't think we're going to be able to conclude that it's a completely unidentified because it is possible that some kind of man-made aircraft could, could make this ring lighting pattern. We just don't know much about it yet. Obviously, you ruled out like a blimp. Well, it's certainly not in the shape of a blimp. Uh, it could be something mounted on a balloon or some other li lighter than aircraft. Uh, but a blimp typically has aviation lights on it when it's operating at night. Uh, also, uh, I don't believe there are any blimps operating in that part of the country. There's not that many blimps. You know, we went through this exercise a couple of years ago and determined that there's actually only a few blimps, and, and most of them have kind of a regional area that they operate in. There, There is, I should point out, we ex we're expecting more blimps in the future, uh, not not uh, advertise, the kind of advertising things that you see normally, but it would be military or cargo applications. People are starting to look seriously at very large lighter than air craft for cargo applications. So it's uh, hopefully those will all have a very standard lighting pattern that will make it easy to identify. I used to live in Southern yeah. California in the South Bay where we had the Goodyear blimp moored right near us. And we'd see it almost every night. Now, the first time you see it, you go, what the hell is that? But then it turns and you can see, oh, there's something on the side like drink Coca-Cola. But the first time you see it, it's a little weird. Uh, and uh, then you, you get used to it. Now, you where was this in Washington State exactly? Uh, well, I don't want to give away oh. the, the exact location, but it, it's uh, a little bit, uh, it's pretty much uh, due west of Seattle, just across the bay. That where well, the sound. Seattle. Yes. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, there, there's a, uh, you know, on Puget Sound there, there's a, uh, there, there's a number of islands and, and uh, other land uh, over there. It's not far from the, there, there's, a, there's a naval uh, shipyard nearby where they, yeah. where they dry dock uh, aircraft carriers. Yeah, and, and they have uh, also a, uh, a, sub, a submarine base near there. But uh, I couldn't find any real aviation operations near there, the military aviation, as far as I can tell. Of course, there's a lot of civil aviation in a populated area like that. And of course, as we know, there's lots of people out there flying these little um, radio-controlled aircraft, with, and you can get different lighting kits. So uh, we don't know what, I, I think we're going to close it. I don't know how it's going to get closed yet. I think I want, but, but I'm not, the movement looks like it's nothing anomalous. It's not moving faster than a, a drone or a plane could. And uh, the only thing that's really anomalous about it is the lighting and the flash, the, the very rapid flash. Uh, the fact that these things are almost a perfect circle indicates that, uh, and a 30 second exposure indicates that they're a very uh, quick, bright flash, which is not be typical of a drone. 
But then again, you know, I don't think there's, I don't know if there's any rules really about what kind of patterns these, these quadcopters have to carry on their, uh, on their, their LEDs that they have attached. Yeah, it's really the wild west for those little drones. It is. And, you know, we had a, a news, news story today about a guy who was arrested for shooting one down. Oh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> he thought he was trying to spy on a 16-year-old daughter. So, he, you know, I do the same thing. Hell. Yeah, God fearing Kentuckian, man. He shot that bad boy out of the sky. <laughs> I would be compelled to do the same thing. Well, you got a teenage daughter like I do. Yeah. You, you, you know, you think about that kind of thing. Yeah. So, Paul, are you going to be able to include um, a picture and, and Antonio, too? And I can link my video that that guy sent, the YouTube link, and you guys can get uh, links to the pictures. Is that possible? Well, I have, I can, yeah, I, I have a nice crop of the uh, of the best image of the object, which Good. Uh, is probably the best thing for people to look at. If they look at the if they look at the the overall image, it's very pretty, but it's very hard to see the object in it. You have to zoom in uh, because, but because it's a nice uh, high resolution RAW image there's no compression on this image at all you can zoom in reliably and not worry about things like compression artifacts as many listeners probably know there is a host of different resources available to learn more about the study and discussion of ufos and related topics Probably the largest and best well-known organization is MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. MUFON and other organizations often hold periodic symposiums and conferences around the states. My colleagues and I attend those that we can, and most recently I attended MUFON's Erie, Pennsylvania 2015 UFO conference. The speakers included Bill Konkoleski, an experiencer who happens to run the Michigan MUFON chapter, Roswell researcher and investigator Don Schmidt, chemist Phyllis Puttinger reporting on physical trace evidence from UFOs, and author Peter Robbins, who wrote the best-selling book Left at Eastgate, examining the famous 1980 military Rendlesham Forest UFO encounter. On the part of the story I know best, that being the involvement of one um, at the time Airman First Class, United States Air Force Security Police Officer, Larry Warren. Larry is an American hero in my mind and a classic whistleblower. Whistleblower. John Ventry, who hosted the event, gave a presentation showing the long ancient evidence of UFO encounters from historic texts, graphics, and paintings. In India, they're talking about this 6000 BC. They rose into the air in a huge metal shining vessel they launched a great shining lance that rode on a beam of light. They didn't know how to describe this stuff, but this is what they wrote. When uh, Greeks were writing the Iliad and the Odyssey, <laughs> India was writing this, and they didn't know how to He also it. spoke of a more recent right. text, it, it of reportedly of a U.S. Air Force Military Academy training document outlining the supposed well-known long-term presence of alien interaction with Earth and its inhabitants. Chapter 33 is on UFOs at the Air Force Physics course. They said that this has been going on for as long as 47,000 years. So if anybody asks you, how long has this been going on? 47,000 years. How do you know that? That's what the Air Force said. So I had a chance to speak Force with John Ventry regarding the demographics, popularity, and attendance of most UFO conferences in his geographic locale. Well, this is our third uh, annual conference here in Erie. It looks like the uh, crowd this year is about 180 people. The last two years we had about 210. So a little bit drop in attendance here in Erie. Now, in Pittsburgh, though, it's been on a pretty steady increase. Uh, we had uh, 297 last year, 293 the year before, and, and probably 250 the year before that. So it seems like Pittsburgh is on the increase. Uh, Erie has been steady right around 200, and the demographics have pretty much when you look at, you know, they're adults. They're people over 40. A lot of the crowd is probably over 50 and in their 60s. But uh, it's, it's a pretty solid group that shows up at our three conferences, and, you know, I think everybody's comfortable talking about UFOs here. 
Now, there's been some talk about whether or not younger people are going to come in and why there isn't more interest by younger people. Um, can you explain that? Yeah. I, I think with the younger people, the problem is they don't have the money. I mean, we offer a student uh, discount, but what happens is they don't, you know, even if it's $20, they, they don't have the $20 that they're going to spend on a conference. It, it just, the, everything I've seen with students is they don't pay to go to this type of event. They'll find the money to pay for a rock event. The conference was rather well attended, and there were younger members in the audience who I spoke with. I've noticed that the demographics for a lot of UFO conferences is mostly older people, but you look quite a bit younger, and another friend here too, and a few others. So what brought you to this conference? Well, actually, uh, my dad is has, is a member of the MUFON Society and is very involved in all of this, and I've always been interested, you know, partially because of him, but just because I find it interesting myself. But um, ultimately, came along with him, happy to be here, and uh, happy to be learning more. It's awesome. You kind of seem part of the millennial generation, so what do others of your generation, would you say, uh, if you have to speak for all of them, which is tough, what do you think their take on this subject is? Um, I think it's very mixed. I think with more education, more information available, there are a lot of people who tend to steer in the opposite direction, kind of tend to disbelieve because of what's out there. But I also think that there's a large group of people that that still hold on to the ideas and and are curious and are still open-minded. I think um, that's a huge part of, of just our generation in general, but uh, especially when it comes to stuff like this, that we're willing to ask more questions and maybe resolve that that there's not always a concrete answer to everything. I wanted to know what you thought of this conference, if you've attended other UFO conferences, and what your thoughts are on this particular one. Well, I've been to a couple Michigan meetings. Uh, This compares very similar to it. I find a lot of the information is interesting. Some of it I find could be pareidolia. The other parts I find I don't know how to explain, which makes me want to think and look further into them. most likely some kind of organization in your area that covers the UFO topic. Typically, you can find out when and where simply by a Google search. Case files, case files. And now, here's API Deputy Director Paul Carr and Unidentified Science. This is a work in progress. My notes on high strangeness cases and the hope, if any, of a scientific approach to these cases. What do I mean by high strangeness cases? I mean cases that may or may or not involve UAPs, but go beyond even close encounters of the third kind and also involve unexpected elements like interactions with a witness, distortions of time, and other strange events that generally fall into the broad category of paranormal. I have resisted lumping paranormal experiences with UAPs and continue to resist this because at face value, different categories of human experience could well admit of different explanations. However, what is common in all this is the human experiencer. And nearly all cases we have to study are the memories of the experiencers. In Unidentified Science 3, I talked about some of the problem with eyewitness testimony, rooted in the flaws of human perception and memory, and almost as much of a problem 
are our oversimplified mental models of how these work. But this is not a reiteration of those concerns, real as they are. I want to make a point about High Strange's cases, and that is that we have no basis for dismissing them out of hand, or for ignoring the stranger elements, or for regarding the experiencers as mentally deranged. We have the experiencers, their memories, and what they are willing to tell us about themselves. And we are not justified in jumping to conclusions about the experiences themselves. Note that I am not approaching these cases as a psychologist who wants to know how people could possibly remember such absurd things. That is one possible approach, although I don't think it's completely satisfying by itself. As a field investigator, I want to find the facts of the case, and we struggle with the facts, if any, masked by all the oddities. So, does it become impossible to proceed straightforwardly? If we ask what we really have before us, then the usual situation is that we have a mentally functional person with memories that make no sense to us. Quite possibly, there is another person who can corroborate some of the memories. For example, in a recent case, we had a normal married couple who shared the opposite of a missing time experience, an added time experience, in which common tasks that should have taken hours were completed in 15 minutes. Both thought it must be late afternoon, but it was, in fact, hours earlier. To the investigator, there's no way to make sense of this. But it is also difficult to dismiss the witnesses as liars or lunatics. Well, I can't give you the answer. I can suggest that we not filter out these strange experiences, concentrating solely on what the witness saw in the sky. The questions we need to ask should focus on the data we have, which is information about the witness and their memories. What it was behind the memories, we may never know, but I can guarantee you we will certainly never know if we jump into premature theorizing, ignore the context and related cases. This is why I am enthused about the recent Project CORE. This project attempts to look for patterns across cases and across experiencers. I am not sure if they went far enough with their questions or asked all the right ones, but it was a start, and to my knowledge, the first study of its kind, and points the way to more definitive, comprehensive studies in the future. Is there anything different about high strangest experiencers from low strangest UAP witnesses, from people who report no strange experiences? It's not that we'll find the answers there, but maybe we'll figure out how to ask the questions. I'm not sure what the next Unidentified Science will be about and would be interested in your input. Visit our listener community on Google Plus or stop by our subreddit and let us know what you think. The complete script for this segment will be linked in the show notes. This brings us to the end of API Case Files Episode 7, which was produced by Marcia Barnhart with help from Antonio Paris and Paul Carr. Links in the show notes for this episode can be found at apicasefiles.libsyn.com. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomena Investigations. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. All music heard on this podcast is licensed under Creative Commons. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for sharing their creative spirit. If you want to drop us a line, that would be great. We can read your letters on the show, and we always appreciate your ideas and input on content. Episode 8 of API Case Files should be out late October 2015 with more case discussions, more interviews, and hopefully some interesting input from you, our listeners. We're glad you could join us today, and we hope you recommend this podcast to your friends and acquaintances.
is API case file search file.